Northview, how are you doing this morning? It is good to see you. Hey, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your phone, Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be. I want to say a special hello to all of you who are joining us online. We're so grateful uh, that you are connected with us as well. Same for you. If you've got a Bible, Luke chapter 10, we're going to be continuing in our series called Fierce. This series has been a look at a handful of women in the Bible who have displayed just incredible or exemplary faith uh, in God. And we've been looking at their lives and their stories and, and uh, some of their faith journey so that it can influence ours. And I don't know about you, but anytime I see someone uh, in Scripture specifically, uh, but it could be in life also, uh, take or do something ex- exemplary in their faith, it's always a challenge to me in, in a good way, in a healthy way, in a way that makes me think about my own life, my own journey, and what God might be calling or asking me uh, to do. And uh, the story that we're going to look at today is certainly one of those. Now, now, sometimes when we talk about faith, and specifically we talk about like exemplary faith, maybe you wonder, like, I want that, but how do I get that? Is that something you just have, or is that something that develops? Is that something that grows? I think you're going to see from the story we look at today, it is something that gets developed. It's something that gets shaped, and it's something that God is even doing in you today. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he was confident that the work that God started in them, he was talking about at the time of their salvation, that the work that God had started in them, that he would carry it on to the day of completion. And I think there's a story, there's a particular woman in the Bible that, um, in my opinion, gets a little bit of a bad rap. And I think she's got a much stronger faith than she actually gets credit for. Her name is Martha. Um, In the Bible, she's often connected to her sister, Mary, and often compared to her sister, Mary. In fact, we talked about Mary just a few weeks ago, and we talked about this incredible moment of faith where where, where she had opened this alabaster jar filled with this expensive ointment, and, and, she, and she just worshiped Jesus in, in a particular moment that was, it was breathtaking. It was almost scandalous. There were people who wondered like, man, what are you doing, Mary? Are you going over the top? And we talked about how that was just connected to Mary's faith. And she just said, I don't know how long I'm going to have Jesus with me. I know I have him in this moment. And so while I have him in this moment, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he knows how much I love him and how much I appreciate him. And so she just did it. But Martha is the sister of Mary. Martha is often compared to her, and often it's almost like Mary is the good faith picture, Martha is the bad faith picture. I don't think that's fair. I really don't think that's fair. Martha is a type A kick butt, take names, doer. I mean, she is a she will out hustle you, she will outwork you, she will out Martha Stewart you. I mean, she is just that. I mean, she will serve Jesus so hard and so well, she'll knock you down <laughs> doing it uh, because she's just she's just passionate about doing everything as well and as hard as she can. But there's a famous story, and we're going to dive into it. This is part of where the separation between the two uh, sisters often takes place. And it's this story in Luke chapter 10. Jesus and his disciples are traveling, and they stop at the house of Mary, Martha, and then their brother, Lazarus. And Luke 10, 38 says Jesus and his disciples were on their way. They came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary's chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So there's the moment. There's this 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 encapsulated moment. Jesus and the disciples come in and uh, Martha is the one that opens the home, right? So let's give her some credit. She's the one that says, come on in. What, What do you do when someone uninvited shows up at your house? 
Let me just kind of work through my brain. And, and some of you ladies, you can kind of speak into this too. Guys, they're a little more oblivious to this. In fact, I learned this after last service because there was something on the list that I wasn't even thinking about. Uh, but but when, when someone unexpected shows up at our house, and it's like you're going to invite them in. You're happy to see them, and you're going to invite them in. The first thought, how many of you, the first thought that you go, oh my goodness, what are the condition of my bathrooms? Have anybody, that's the first thought. That's the first thought in our house. Our main bathroom is the bathroom that the kids use. Jamie and I have one off of our bedroom. Our main bathroom is the one the kids use, and it is a constant source of frustration. It is a constant source of poor parenting uh, on our part, because there's always something left on the floor, toothpaste all over the sink, handprints on stuff, not to mention a few other things that just go along with boys. And so my first concern is always bathrooms. Second concern, second thought. Oh no, come on in. Yes, we want you to come in. And then I'm thinking dog hair, dog hair. We have a golden retriever and she sheds hair like it's her full-time job all day, every day. This, it's, it's, it's a fascination that I have that no matter how much hair you comb out of her, there's always more. It doesn't matter if you spent an hour doing it. If you take one more brush stroke, you will always get more. And so you have to vacuum and sweep almost daily or else it just looks like the most unkempt place in the world. Now, let me be honest. Do we vacuum or sweep every single day? I wish I could say that's the case. My second thought would be dog hair. Third thought would be dishes. <laughs> In theory, they're supposed to be taken care of. Our kids are on a rotation, and they're supposed to work through the dishes every day. And in theory, I'm supposed to wake up to get my morning coffee, and I'm pulling clean dishes out of the cupboard that have been put away from the previous night, and the counters are totally clean, and there's nothing dirty on the counter. In theory, that's what's supposed to happen. How many days in seven do you think, in theory, happens at my house? Two? Two? Maybe. I would take two some weeks. I would take two. All right. Now, some, some women afterwards told me the first thought that they would have would be food. Food. I wouldn't be as worried about food. To be honest, we can order a pizza. We can order 10 if we need to. You know, that's where my head goes. I'll just call Anthony's. We'll get some pizzas delivered. We'll be good. You know, but food is obviously an important thing when a whole bunch of people show up at your house and it's clear they're going to be staying for a while. Who's going to feed them? Who's going to give them something to drink? That's where Martha is at. She just invited Jesus and his followers over into her house and she goes into hyperdrive trying to get everything prepped and, and ready for him. Okay. She comes out at some point she gets overwhelmed. Didn't plan on cooking for all these people. She's back in the kitchen. At some point she comes out. And she stops whatever is being done or said in the room and says, Jesus, tell my sister to get her rear end in the kitchen and help. In other words, like if you guys want to eat, you need to get her off the floor sitting there listening to you. I need help here in the kitchen. So I'm in hospitality mode for a while, but now I'm into, I got Mission Impossible in front of me and I need some help. Tell her to get her butt in the kitchen and help me out. And what happens? Jesus doesn't do it. He doesn't rebuke Mary, who's sitting at the feet listening to Jesus. He rebukes Martha for what she just said. He rebukes her instead. And so in this moment, Mary, or Martha goes through a, a, a faith-stretching experience. This is why I appreciate her. Because again, we like to sometimes say Mary's the good sister, Martha's the bad one. No, no, no. Here's the best way to think of Martha. Martha is a female Peter. You know, Peter is full of zeal and passion and commitment, except when he's not. <laughs> and he does it right, and he's full go, and he is 100% exactly what Jesus wants of him, except when he's not. <laughs> and, and we get all this, like, Scripture airtime on Peter, where this faith that is fierce, I mean, there's no denying he believes in Jesus. It has to get refined and redirected, and 
I think the best way to see Martha is to see her in that similar vein. She is a go-getter. She is a hustler. There is no doubt she loves Jesus. She has fierce faith, but fierce faith does not equal finished faith. That's not just true of her. That's true of all of us. You can have incredibly passionate, deep faith in Jesus, but you will always have growth and he will always be trying to go through a refining process, a finishing process with you. Lots of things in this world require finishing until they're done. My dad's a woodworker. There's a whole process after you build whatever piece of wood you build, you know, dresser, table, chairs, but there's still a finishing process to complete it, right? Uh, over the over the quarantine a show that my family got hooked on and we rarely all five enjoy the same show but we got hooked onto this show called forged in fire right and it's this whole uh, show that's made of these guys are making swords and weapons and it's just really cool blacksmithing cut type stuff but uh at the this metals that they would use as they're making a sword or a dagger or whatever it might be would, would go through all this shaping and hammering, and then they would heat it up, and then they would, they, there's a whole process of finishing it called the quench, where it would go in oil or go in water, and that would just harden up this uh, steel so it was ready for battle, it was ready for use. This, I think Martha was going through a quenching or a hardening in a good way, a finishing process in some of these stories that she's in with Jesus. And I think the questions that are basically asked of her are the same questions that are asked of all of us as we go on our journey with Jesus. In other words, I think her story is our story. I think the questions asked of her by Jesus are the same ones you're going to hear when you read stories in Scripture, when you hear sermons preached, when you spend time alone in prayer. The Holy Spirit is going to be impressing on you as you see God's will explicitly spoken. You're going to see and hear these questions asked over and over. The question isn't, do you believe in Jesus? Many of you have established that. Yes, I do. But let me see if you could answer these three questions that are often asked. Here's one of them. This was asked of Martha. Will I allow Jesus to correct my my commitment to him when my expression is out of character? There was no doubt she loved Jesus. There was also no doubt whatever she thought was supposed to happen in that moment or whatever she thought maturity looked like was not correct. And so she gets put very publicly in a place where her faith has to get challenged in in the sense of what I said, what I thought, or maybe just the way I acted was not in line with the character of Christ. And so I have to adjust. Listen, this is called normal, everyday discipleship. You will constantly find yourself in situations maybe on a daily basis where you, 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 you are, because we're fallen, broken people, even in our best attempts to love and serve Jesus, we will sometimes get it wrong. And in those moments, here's a, it's a great question to ask. Will I allow in those moments when Jesus challenges me, when Jesus reveals, hey, listen, I do love him, but my expression in this moment was not correct. Will I allow him to correct me? Will I swallow my pride and will I allow him to correct me in those moments? See, listen, you got to understand what was Jesus rebuking? Was it Martha's hospitality? Absolutely not. There was absolutely nothing wrong with hospitality. In fact, Jesus commended those who took in disciples and showed them hospitality. So why would he reverse course in this moment and say hospitality is a bad thing? He's not doing that at all. Is Is he then rebuking Mary for sitting at his feet? Well, we we know that not to be true because when told to do that, Jesus says no. He does not rebuke Mary for listening at his feet. And this is huge because this is not just rebuking Martha. It's affirming Mary, not just to her sister, but to the entire room, specifically all the men in the room. Here you have Mary sitting at the feet of a teacher. You only sat at the feet of the teacher if you were a student of the teacher. And if you were a student of the teacher, it was assumed that as a student, you would someday be a teacher. 
of others. Well, in Jesus' day, the men pushed all the women aside and didn't allow them to have that kind of role. And here's this woman sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she says, she, and he says about her, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. He's affirming her in this moment, making room for this woman to hear and learn and teach his message. Jesus rebukes Martha, not for her hospitality or for Mary's learning. He rebukes Martha for the way she shamed her sister's response to Jesus. That's what he was rebuking. That's what he was rebuking. Because see, Mary, or excuse me, Martha fell into a trap that some of us find ourselves falling into where we say, my view or my way of responding to Jesus is the best, maybe even the only way to do it in this moment. Martha is saying, basically, if you love Jesus, Mary, you would be in the kitchen serving. You would be just like me. You would see the world just like I see it. And you would see Jesus just like I see him. And you would respond in the same way. And Jesus is responding to the way she's shaming her in that moment and saying, that is not correct. That is not correct. So this opens up a second question. Not just will I allow Jesus to correct me when my expression of faith is out of character, but secondly, will I, will I serve Jesus wholeheartedly without diminishing the way others are serving? Will I allow the conviction he puts on my heart to serve him in the way he's wired and led me to be enough? And can I celebrate the, the way others do things a little differently? Martha is so distracted in this moment by, this, by, by what Mary's doing that she just even stops the hospitality. She stops serving in the kitchen. She stops and, and interrupts Jesus. She's, she's so distracted she can't even serve because she's shaming her sister. Listen, it's easy to love what you do. I see this in the church often. We're all wired differently. We get passionate about different ministries. One of the things that's cool about a healthy church is that there's all kinds of ministries and all kinds of places to play, all kinds of places to serve, all different ways to express, this is what Jesus has done in my heart, and this is how I'm going to serve him. This is how much time I'm going to give. This is how much money I'm going to give. This is the specific ministry that I'm going to be committed to. And it's really easy to start thinking in the, in the, in the idea that, and this is the best way, and the, the, the true followers of Jesus all see it and do the same exact thing that I do. They give to this mission organization, or they work in this particular ministry, or they spend this amount of time on task. And all of a sudden, this starts to do something in our hearts. You believe that the way you serve Jesus is the right way. And you look around at a f room full of people, and often maybe you're tempted to think they're just doing it wrong. They're doing it different. But here's, here's the truth of this story. In all of human history, there's just a handful of people, a handful, that could ever say they had Jesus in their living room. Martha's one of them. Martha's one of them. And what Jesus is, is, is establishing in this moment is not that what Mary did was good, Martha did is bad. Because what Martha did was perfectly fine. In and of itself, a handful of people, only a handful have ever had Jesus in their living room. And to be able to prep and cook a meal for him and his followers is an unbelievable honor and experience. But again, there's only a handful of people who've ever had Jesus in the living room, and Mary was also one of them. She was also one of them. And it was also appropriate simultaneously while Martha was prepping for food for Mary to be sitting at Jesus' feet and soaking up every single word that he had to say. I don't think when, 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 he's choose, when Jesus says that Mary has chosen the better, that he's specifically saying it would be better if you dropped all kitchen duties and joined her and listened to me. That's often how it's treated in its interpretation. I think he's affirming, Martha, what you're doing is good. What Mary is doing is good. She's chosen for her what is better. Only one thing will do. Some, in some interpreters even take that to mean, Martha, all you needed to cook was one dish. You don't need to put out this smorgasbord. Just, you know, one basic meal is enough for us. 
It's not that what she was doing was wrong. It's that when shame entered into the question, into the story, and she couldn't see that sometimes God puts us in situations and even wires us to do different things, that we should celebrate how God has called us. Peter had to learn this. Um, when Peter, uh, this is after the resurrection, Peter, right, right before Jesus died, remember famously denies him three times. After the resurrection, he has this restoration moment with Jesus. And Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And most believe that that's, that repetition is to kind of counteract those three denials. Do you love, Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Okay. And then he says, Jesus does about Peter, hey, when you get old, people are going to lead you to a place that you don't want to go. He starts talking about the way he's going to die. And Peter would be uh, crucified also later in his life to end his life. So Peter, John is with him. And so he says, well, what about him? I mean, you just told me my story, but what's his future? And Jesus stops him. And he says, what is it to you? what I call John, to be or do. You follow me. I love that. I have it highlighted in my Bible. Doesn't matter what Jesus has called anybody else to do. What has he called me to do? How has he called me to serve? What do I know that he's asking and expecting of me? That's the only thing that matters. This is uncomfortable for Martha. She's more black and white, no gray. You ever known people like that? Maybe you are someone like that. There's just, there's yes, no's, there's good, evils, there's nothing. It's, it's, it's one or the other. This is stretching of her. This is pushing her in a spot that she doesn't like. She doesn't like. This is stressful for her, right? But as a follower, this is part of the finishing process. Jesus is going to constantly tweak and stress you. And in the end, it's to grow you. It's to grow you. You know, trees have a, scientists have figured out that there's a, there's a term called stress wood. And when trees undergo stress, primarily from wind, it could be from drought, but when they go through hard times, the roots will get stronger for one, but also the actual wood itself and the fibers in the wood will take on a different composition. There's a hardening that goes on in that wood to help it against uh, future winds. You remember the biodome experiment? Some of you guys are old enough to remember this in the, in the early 90s where they built like this place out in Arizona and it was going to be this, this like, you know, Biosphere 2 is what it was called and bi we live on Earth, which is supposed to be Biosphere 1. One of the fascinating developments is this was, it was a total flunk. A bunch of people spent a bunch of money and the only thing that came out of it was a Pauly Shore movie. Uh, that was probably the only good part uh, of that whole thing. But um, the... <laughs> The, the, the trees in this place wouldn't survive and they kept toppling over and they couldn't figure out like what's wrong with all our trees. Well, there was no wind in the biosphere and they figured out wind is pretty critical. Like it, the stress that the wind creates is critical for the development and the hardening of these trees. Jesus is coming in and blowing some wind at Martha. Her faith is not defeated. Her faith is not gone. He's just hardening it. He's finishing it. He's stretching her in this moment, just like he's going to stretch you. So here then becomes the big, big question. When he does this, will you follow Jesus past the edges of your comfort? When you see that and feel that wind blowing, because and Martha was asked this question later down the road in a very, very profound way. Here's how it happened. Her brother Lazarus died. He'd been dead four days. They'd, as he was sick and dying, she was hopeful, like her, her and her sister Mary, hopeful that Jesus would show up, that he would intervene, and they trusted and believed. They'd seen Jesus do amazing things. They knew he could save Lazarus, but he's nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. He shows up four days late. Now we learn uh, from the, the way the story breaks that he did it on purpose. He waited it out on purpose so that no one could ever wonder, was Lazarus dead or not? But to in fact know he was dead, dead. He shows up four days late. And as he starts to come into uh, kind of the, the family compound or the house, there's wailing and crying. There's funeral going on. 
Martha, the one who sometimes is seen as the one with little faith, Mary with great faith. Mary's in the house bawling her eyes out. Martha's the one that meets up with Jesus. Why? That's who she is, right? She's that type A, go get her. I don't care if I'm sad. I don't care if there's problems. We got a funeral to plan. Here comes the minister. You know, we're gonna, I gotta work through it. I, we just gotta go. She's the one that meets him out in the yard. She says, if you just could have been here, if you just could have been here earlier, this whole thing could be different. Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe? And she replies in verse 38. Or sorry, she says, I believe. I believe in the one who's to come. So, so that you're the Messiah to come into the world. They go in and get Mary. She's crying. Jesus is crying. Uh, verse 38, once more deeply moved. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. And this is where this is going beyond the comfort level for Martha. But Lord, said Martha, sister of the dead man, by this time, there's a bad odor. He's been there four days. The King James translation is just flat awesome right here. Martha says, but Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> we can't roll the stone back. God, this is, no, no. It's going to not, this is not going to go good. This is, no, he stinks. This is going to, we can't open the tomb back up. Then in verse 40, Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they took away the stone then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out and his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What a moment. What a moment where someone's faith goes through in a very compressed amount of time, a finishing process. I mean, it literally is like taking that, that hot metal that's just been shaped over a lifetime of experiences and in an instant sub submerging it into that quenching fluid and having some things that never made sense before or some growth that was trying to happen but couldn't quite break through just instantly happened. She was passionate about Jesus. She believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he took her to a whole other place. She, he went way beyond her comfort zone, stretched her way beyond just worrying about a meal. He brought her brother back from the dead, something she never thought was possible. She was invited into a moment to trust him. And she did, even though everything inside of her said, this is not good. He stinks. This is not going to go well. She trusted him. And a whole world of possibilities just opened up. And a funeral procession turns into a party. And I can imagine that for a moment, it was just absolute pandemonium. That the scene was, I mean, people wiping away tears and starting to laugh and hugging and running around. And maybe whatever the gathering was, 30, 40, 50, as word was quickly traveling, people would be running in. Imagine if somebody down the street just said the guy who was dead four days ago is now alive. Would you just sit on the couch and would you go, eh, all right. You would go running to see this as the crowd gathered just wondering here wonder what went through Martha and her through her head as now a crowd assembles at her house. I wonder if that same thought that she had when Jesus and his first disciples came would pop up in her head if she was going, oh no, I got all these people. What are we going to eat? What are we going to do? Is the house picked up? Is it cleaned up? And I don't know any of this to be true or false. But I have to believe that in this moment, Martha probably, maybe for the first time, just rested, just rested 
in the finished work of Jesus. And just let the joy of that transforming work that he had done in front of her very eyes just take her beyond amazement, take her beyond wonder to a place of just soul awe, where her, just to the very core of who she was, she was just in awe of wonder and wonder of who Jesus was and what he had done in her life. I think that's a place that he wants to take all of us, to a place of, of awe and wonder, of deep and abiding joy that can never, ever be removed. But may Martha's story remind us that the journey to that is one of faith refining and stretching questions. My prayer is that today, if you've never had an opportunity to, that you would be ready today to say, that is the Jesus that I want to follow. I want to commit my life to him. I want to surrender my will to him. I want to have his, his death on the cross. I want to accept that in, into my life. I want that payment for my sin to be realized. I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to follow him through all the different seasons of life and allow him to shape me and change me and, 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 and finish me. Man, if that's a decision that you want to make as we sing uh, these next songs, I'll be standing in the back. Just come on back and, and join me for a word of prayer or conversation. I'd love to talk to you. For the rest of us, let's use this moment. Let's use this moment just to sit in awe of God and to worship Him for all that He's done, for the ways He steps into our lives, for the way He refines us, and for the work that He promises to complete in us before he comes back to get us. Will you stand up with me? Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. And we thank you for your word, for the way it speaks to us, for the way it reminds us of the journey that we're on and the work that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for people who you have used in, in, in ancient days, who have experienced life with you, who have given us ways and windows into the faith experience that we couldn't have otherwise seen. We thank you for Martha, for, for her willingness to be stretched and to be used by you. And Lord, we ask you, what could we learn from it? Where do you want us to grow in our life? We point our ultimate focus on Jesus. We look to him as our refiner, as the author and perfecter of our faith. So now we worship him and we follow him. And it's in your name that we pray.